Okay. Where do we now, submit? Uh, it's, what is the assignment to submit our review? For yeah, the, so basically at the end, right, you're going to submit a PDF of your review problems, and it's going to be underneath the exam three makeup module. There's an assignment where you can submit to. Actually, if you go to the review session module, we'll take right back to that assignment. Okay. So there's kind of like two unit three review sessions, but they'll all point back to the same assignment where you're going to upload your PDF. Well, all right, give me one second to get ready here. And you're, you're recording the, this review, right? Yes. Well, okay, I have to leave, but I'll watch cool. the review. All right, I'll see you tomorrow. Okay. Now we gotta go all the way the freak back to chapter uh, sixteen and chapter. Six. Yep. A lot of conjugated bond business. Okay. All right. So back to stuff we haven't thought about in a long time, right? So unit one was about aromatic compounds as well as conjugated dienes. So it's all about pi bonds being in conjugation with one another and what that does for us. First of all, if something, you know, what is the big difference between a structure like this and a structure like this? What can I say about these two compounds? The left one has conjugated pi bonds and the other one doesn't. So this is conjugated. This is one is what we call isolated. And what else can I say about these compounds in terms of their stability? The left one's more stable. This one's more stable. So conjugated and stability go like hand in hand. Basically, the more resonant structures a compound has, the more stable it is. It is one of these magical quantum mechanical phenomenon uh, that exists where, and it, you can kind of just simplify it as easy as if there's a bunch of resonance structures, that means that compound is more stable. Um, and what makes it so that these, these bond, uh, this particular compound right here, that these double bonds are not conjugated? What, what do I mean by conjugated, I guess? Let's go there. Overlapping pi bonds. Overlapping or... pi bonds. But so what does that mean? Because these pi bonds aren't really overlapping, are they? Um, the way they're shaped, they're like both pointed in the same direction. So they both be kind of like this. So the electrons can pass through that pi orbital or those two pi orbitals yeah so remember that this has everything to do with kind of like the geometry of what a pi bond looks like versus a sigma bond pi bond has these p orbitals that are extending above and below and when you have conjugation it means you have these p orbitals kind of lined up all in a row so those electrons can you know talk to each other they can flow across that entire network what is it about our isolated diene over here that messes that up there's like a no chance for resonance gap. no chance for resonance and why which which atom here is messing everything up that middle one is sp3 hybridized exactly this one is sp3 hybridized right and that's the key sp3 hybridized meaning it means it doesn't have a p orbital that can kind of like participate in this network okay um, one of the things that I can do that would sort of change that is if instead of being an sp3 hybridized carbon, that was a positive charge. Now all of a sudden it's sp2 hybridized and you can have resonance with that molecule, right? So remember charges kind of factor in, especially we'll do some examples talking about aromaticity, um, where you got to account for the fact that if there's a charge on it, it can be sp2 hybridized. 
Okay, let me see. There's gotta be a good picture here. So uh, there's another type of diene that we learned about these cumulated dienes, like carbon dioxide would be a good example of accumulated diene. Quite frankly, they're not terribly common. Uh, the important thing there is that carbon in the middle, those two P orbitals are located, you know, one's perpendicular, or I'm sorry, one's horizontal, and that's not the right way, one's vertical and one's horizontal. So they can't talk to each other like a conjugated diene. For conjugated diene, everything is all nice and in a row. It can all talk to one another. If it's isolated, again, you have that SP3 hybridized carbon in the middle, that's kind of messing everything up. So those two double bonds can no longer talk to one another. Okay. Um, let's see. Hold on, let me organize my life here. Um, one thing to keep in mind in this chapter is we talked about molecular orbital theory. Okay, let's go kind of briefly go over this real quick. This would be the molecular orbital diagram of a compound like this that has now four P orbitals that are going to form new molecular orbitals. This is something that kind of drives me crazy to try to teach because it's something that's like deeply, deeply rooted in quantum mechanics. And we don't really talk about quantum mechanics at all, but we still have to have like this qualitative understanding of this particular molecular orbital theory, okay? Um, molecular, this basically is explaining why pi bonds are, why conjugated dienes are so stable is because the individual P orbitals, all four of them will mix together to form new molecular orbitals, okay? So the big thing about this, I mean, in terms of just questions that I'm thinking that they could ask you, really, I think like knowing how many molecular orbitals are formed, how many are bonding and how many are anti-bonding, I can't imagine that they have that many more detailed questions to ask. I don't, you know, you're not gonna have to draw them obviously, maybe, look, pick out the drawings. I don't know. But anyway, having a qualitative understanding of this stuff is definitely a part of that ACS material. Uh, so again, just to go over what this means, we're talking specifically about this network of conjugated dienes here. So to follow this color coding. All right. And again, what's going to happen is these four P orbitals are going to now mix together and they're gonna form four new molecular orbitals. So that's something that's super crucial about molecular orbital theory. However many atomic orbitals you put in, that's how many molecular orbitals you're gonna get out. Okay, so I have four atomic orbitals, right? Just by atomic orbital, I'm talking about my regular old P orbitals. They're gonna to mix together and now form four, one, two, three, four new molecular orbitals. Half of those are considered to be bonding. The other half anti-bonding. Wow, that was terrible. And what does that really mean? Can somebody tell me? What's the difference between a bonding molecular orbital and an anti-bonding molecular orbital? If they were, if there was electrons in the antibody, weren't they unstable? Or yeah, if you're if all of your antibonding is for is full, you won't have molecular orbitals form because it's unstable. And so yes, that's it. It has everything to do with stability. The point being is, look at this energy scale here. Right here, this is the energy level of a p orbital all by itself. So if I have a p orbital with an electron in it that's not in any sort of bonds, 
it sits at this energy level here. When they mix together to form molecular orbitals, so again, that's here is where my P alone is. Bonding molecular orbitals means that it has lower energy than a P orbital all by itself. Anti-bonding molecular orbital means it has higher energy than a P orbital all by itself. Okay. Um, just to kind of stick on this thing. Remember we talked about molecular orbitals with regard to aromatic compounds as well. Right, and this is sort of a similar idea, but then they gave us this super fancy, where is it? Super fancy method of how we actually draw these molecular orbitals, okay? So unlike on a linear compound, like we just saw, they were just kind of stacked, those different energy levels are all stacked one on top of each other. With a, a aromatic compound, what happens is you have certain energy levels that are at the same position. Hey, there's a fancy word for it. I don't remember. It doesn't really matter. Degenerate, maybe? It doesn't matter. Bottom line, though, is how we're going to draw these. And this is a great little summary slide. You're going to draw that circle. You're going to put your shape in there with the point pointing down, right? So if it's a hexagon, it doesn't really matter because there's points on either side. If you're talking about a pentagon or a heptagon or something. So actually, everybody draw one of these guys. Let's do this. I'll tell you right now that this is an anti-aromatic compound. I want you guys to draw me the molecular orbital diagram and we'll talk about how it proves, how it shows that it's anti-aromatic. But we're gonna be following these steps here. So if you don't remember, I'll leave them up as a little cheat sheet. But let's make sure we know how to draw these molecular orbital diagrams for aromatic compounds. All right, right. So I have my, pentag my pentagon inscribed in my circle. Again, important that that point is pointed down. Where this 
I mean, it's kind of terribly drawn here, but where the uh, corners of my um, pentagon intersect with the circle, these are now my energy levels. All right, so this is what this sort of whole deal represents is that we have energy on our y axis increasing. But those these lines represent the molecular groups that are formed when these p orbitals mix together. So if I'm going to go for this compound here, my, um, uh, you know, my cyclopentadiene with the uh, positive charge there, how many electrons am I going to add to my molecular orbital diagram? Four. Because I got these two here and these two here. So remember what we do when we're filling in molecular orbitals, we start at the bottom. Boom, boom, actually let me use a different color. And then what do I do when I get to two energy levels that are at the same place? One on one and then one on the other. We do yeah, it like- Yeah, half fill first, right? So I'm gonna go through and half fill, okay? Now, again, I told you that this compound was anti-aromatic. The way that this sort of molecular orbital diagram illustrates that is because I have these two half filled orbitals. All right, there's very complicated reasons about like paramagnetism or some crap as to why that destabilizes the ring. Let's not worry about all that. The bottom line is if I have two half filled, that represents an antibonding. I'm sorry, that represents an anti-aromatic compound. Okay, now I have, you know, cyclopentadiene, but the anion version, this is aromatic. And now I have two, four, six electrons that I'm gonna fill in. Whoops, I'm gonna half fill first, but that's four. So then I can go back and fill it all in. So this represents an aromatic compound because all of my bonding orbitals are fully filled. And the, the bond or the line that would separate antibonding and bonding would be between the top one and the middle one? Yeah, it's actually like right here. Okay. Um, this next slide sort of illustrates that more clearly than my drawing does. Okay, and that's okay. Slide, uh, 12, or 30? This is 30, yep. Okay, I really don't foresee them asking you about 10 membered rings or any of that uh, noise, but nonetheless, um, again, just having sort of a qualitative understanding of these molecular orbital diagrams is important. Okay, so now let's talk about sort of the rules for aromaticity here, because uh, this is probably the most important portion of this chapter. Let's just remember what aromaticity does, right? In the same way that we said that residence, resonance structures means that you have a more stable molecule, aromaticity is like resonance on crack. It just is a super stabilizing force, right? And so the way that this compound or this sort of di diagram illustrates that is if you have one double bond on your six membered ring, it would release that much energy, okay? So the whole idea is, well, if you take that and multiply it by three, that's how much you would expect for benzene to release when it's reduced. <clears throat> Turns out that it only reduces, or it only releases that much energy. So quite a bit less, just indicating that it's that much more stable than you would have predicted based on the, um, you know, how much energy is reduced or how much energy is produced when you hydrolyze hydro that. when you reduce a double bond, okay? Bottom line, aromaticity, super stable, okay? Um, so then we learned about these rules. Where is that? Well, whatever. The bottom line, let's go back to our- You had a four in plus two. Yeah, so there's sort of two ways of stating the same rule. And that's either in terms of number of individual electrons is 4n plus 2. The other way is or number of electron pairs 
is odd. There are two ways of saying the exact same thing, but I, you know, I know that some people like thinking about the rule one way, some people like thinking about the rule other way, whichever way sticks in your mind better, whatever, okay? Remember that this 4n plus two, a lot of people look at this and they're like, well, what is n, right? This isn't a math equation. This is a shorthand for a series of numbers where you plug a zero in for n and that's two. You plug a one n for n and that's six. You plug a two n for n and that's 10, et cetera. It's not a math equation. It's a shorthand for a series of numbers. Okay, so let's just take these. So first of all, um, that's the first, this is, you know, this is one rule for being aromatic. The other rule, which is way more straightforward, is it has to be in a ring, right? You can't have any sp3 hybridized carbons that are messing it up. You have to have a ring of conjugated bonds. So that's the first rule. The second rule for aromaticity is this one here, this Huns rule. So again, ring of conjugated by bonds. And then the second one is that, okay? So we're gonna look at these, let's look at three closely related compounds. One of these compounds is aromatic, one of them's anti-aromatic, and one of them's non-aromatic. Okay, so see if you can't classify what's what, and we'll go through and uh, um, sort of redefine what all those terms mean. Is this um, chapter 17? This is chapter 17, yep. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, so this first one, what is that? Anti-aromatic? It's not anti-aromatic. I should call it non-aromatic. Non-aromatic. Aromatic. And what makes it non-aromatic? Oh, because it's got an sp3, so. Boom. So this guy right here is an sp3, which means that it violates our first rule. It's not a ring of conjugated pi bonds. That's what it means to be non-aromatic. You violate that first rule. So there's an sp3 hybridized carbon. It's your, I don't know, not a ring. I don't, I don't know. But anyways, yeah. So that would be non-aromatic. Um, what about our next? Let's actually do this one. Our last one. Uh, aromatic. This one is aromatic because it follows that 4n plus 2 rule. There are two electrons, right? There's nothing in that positive charge. So, so one thing, so for it to be aromatic, it has to be sp2 hybridized all over? Correct. I have a whole ring of conjugated pi bonds. Or, right, I mean, the fact that this is an, um, a carbocation means that you have that empty p orbital. That's, a, that's sp2 hybridized as well. Okay. And then what about this one here? 
That one's anti aromatic. Now we have, we violate. It's gonna violate rule number two. Number two. Then, uh, what was the case that um, isn't there times where we allow electrons in or not in, depending on if it would break or not break aromaticity? Yeah, I mean, truth be told, this was a terrible example because this carbon right here, instead of being sp2 hybridized, it would just be sp3 hybridized, and so it would be non aromatic. So you wouldn't get to count those electrons in the ring. Uh, a better example of anti-aromatic. Let's see if I can draw it. Is when you have your oh no. This would be anti-aromatic. Violates rule two. Okay, because yeah, so uh, where Dylan is going with this is we, we really sort of uh, introduced this concept when we were talking about heterocyclic compounds, right? So something like this, or something like this, okay? Both of these nitrogens have lone pairs that may or may not participate in the resonance of the ring, depending on whether that would sort of make the ring aromatic or non-aromatic, all right? Uh, this guy here, pyrol, this is a famous example of an aromatic compound. And what makes it aromatic is that this pair of electrons on that nitrogen is going to be put in a P or it's almost like the nitrogen gets to decide. Obviously nitrogen doesn't have a brain, but if we're gonna like simplify things, it's almost like these nitrogens get to decide whether or not they're gonna keep their lone pair in a P orbital or an SP3 hybridized orbital. And that decision is gonna all be about whether or not the compound is aromatic. So in this particular example, this will want to contribute that pair of electrons to this ring because that gives it six electrons. So this will be sp2 hybridized. We look at this example here, this nitrogen again can make a decision as, well, as to whether it wants that lone pair to participate in the ring. In this case, it doesn't. And it's just gonna be sp3 hybridized. Why is that? Why would it not want it to participate in the ring? Because if it participated, it would be anti-aromatic, which is more unstable than non-aromatic. Correct, yes. Yeah. So this one would just be non-aromatic. And he's exactly right because anti-aromatic is the worst. Non-aromatic is like neutral and aromatic is great. Right, so in the same way that being aromatic stabilizes a compound, being anti-aromatic actually destabilizes a compound. So if you got a nitrogen that can make a decision, it's just gonna be non-aromatic as opposed to anti-aromatic. Uh, so I have one question. So can you explain where the SP2 hybridized came on, on pyrrol? Because if the nitrogen is sp2 hybridized, it can put the lone pair in the p orbital. And that can make the whole thing aromatic. So again, it's almost like you want to think that the nitrogen has a decision. If it decides to put the lone pair in a p orbital, it will do it if it makes it aromatic. And it won't do it if it'll make it arom anti-aromatic. OK, got it. OK. Um, truth be told, uh, kind of limited number of these heterocyclic compounds. Another kind of famous 
debate or whatever. I don't know how you want to say it, but kind of problem that I could see them asking basically is to compare pur pyridine and pyrrol and particularly that lone pair of electrons, right? So they could do something like ask local electron, um, localized lone pair electrons versus delocalized lone pair electrons. Where are you? Right. And the important thing there is to note that, again, for pyrrol, it needs that lone pair to make that magic number six. So this lone pair will be delocalized. What do I mean by delocalized? Not not part, part of the ring. Difference. Yeah, right. Like just sort of kind of simplify, break down the word delocalized means it's not going to sit still. It's going to be able to move around that whole ring structure. Whereas if we look at pyridine, this pair of electrons, it can't participate in resonance because the nitrogen's already got, you know, this ring's already got its six, six electrons. It's cool. It's already aromatic. There's no way for that pair of electrons to participate. So this is an example of a localized lone pair, even though these are both aromatic. Okay, I mean, truth be told, there are a limited number of these heterocyclics that you're going to kind of stumble upon. So just kind of having the basics of each of them is important. Let's actually just do one more here. This is called furon. This oxygen has two lone pairs on it. How many localized lone pairs do I have and how many delocalized lone pairs do I have? One of each. Nice. Yep. Right, so one of them is going to be delocalized so it can participate in this ring, but then that gets us to six, we're happy. And so this other lone pair is going to be kept localized. So, and it always has to be like that. So one has to be localized and one has to be delocalized? In the case of Furon, yeah. They can't both be delocalized because remember to be in resonance, all those P orbitals have to be like lined up right next to each other. And it's impossible for a single atom to have two P orbitals lined up right like that. But it's also possible to have them both localized. Cause I know in this case not possible, but is it possible for that to happen? Yeah, so for example, uh, what would be something like that? Yeah, so if we did something like this, testing my drawing skills here. Something like this. Both of these oh. lone pairs are localized. Why? Because, because it says they're going to have the odd number of electron pairs. Right, because if, they, if one of them was delocalized, if one of them tried to participate in the resonance of the ring, it would make it anti-aromatic. Right. So in this case, both are local. And this is just non-aromatic. All right, I think there was like a quiz built into Canvas that had literally every example of a heterocyclic compound that I could have possibly thought of. Yeah. Um, so I would review that uh, as well. So, okay, before, what, what do we got here? Yeah, okay, cool. Before we're uh, done, there's, the reactions that I want to go over here, because this was um, a particular section of the ACS was not only conjugated dienes, but reactions of conjugated dienes. And this is another one of these thermodynamic versus um, thermodynamic versus kinetic ones. So I want to make sure that we go over that. Where are we here? I mean, this will work. Um, I think this is a better example. Okay, so remember when we take, first of all, just going back to regular old semester one, if we have an alkene 
and we throw in HBR. This was one of the very first reactions we learned about. You get an addition to this double bond, or you'll have a bromine added on one side and that hydrogen added on the other side, right? This is just first semester, very first reactions of alkenes that we learned about. Okay, so now we're gonna take a conjugated diene. Okay, and one thing that can happen is what's called like the one, two addition, where it's kind of no different than if it was an isolated diene. We have a bromine added to one side of our double bond and a hydrogen added to the other side. This would be called the one, two addition product, but we can also have resonance that's formed, right? So an intermediate, just to kind of go quick, an intermediate in this reaction is gonna be the formation of this carbocation. This carbocation can rearrange itself through resonance. And so we would have It's called a 1,4 addition product. And notice that a key to the 1,4, whoops, I'm sorry, that double bond should be there. A key sort of to the 1,4 addition product is that our double bond has also moved. Right, so it used to be between carbons three and four. When we have a 1,4 addition product, now it's moved and it's between carbons two and three. Okay. So now let's look at just like the data here and see if we can't figure out like what's what here. So at zero degrees Celsius, I, my major product is the one, two adduct. So what do we call it at low temperatures? What is that? Kinetic. Don't cheat, it's on the screen. Yeah, kinetic, right? Low temperatures are your kinetic product. High temperatures are your thermodynamic product. Notice that when we jack up the temperature, all of a sudden, we get a different distribution of products. That favors the one four addition. Okay, this is all sorts of jacked up. Let me see if I can simplify this here. Okay, so first of all, the one two, um, The one, two addict is always going to be the one that's kinetically favored. Okay, it's always gonna be the one that forms quicker. We're gonna see an example where we can't say that quite as hard and true about the one, four. That might not always be the thermodynamic, but the thing that is always true is the one, two is always the quickest form the kinetic product. Um, the argument there is because when the hydrogen gets added to one side of the double bond, the bromine's right there, ready to go. So it just happens quicker, right? Remember at low temperatures, things are moving slower. So if when this positive charge forms, the bromine's already right there, it's moving really slowly, it can't escape, whatever. The one, two is always going to be the kinetic product. In this particular example, the one, four is the thermodynamic product. It's more stable. Why? What is it about the one, four that's more stable? more highly substituted yeah so also kind of cheat and written on the screen it's the more highly substituted alkene okay so let me just do two examples here um what are we gonna do so something like this uh that's the harder one Okay, so HBr, high temperatures, HBr, low temperatures.
So at low temperatures, what's it always going to be? The one, two. The one, two, always. Okay, and just to sort of draw in my hydrogen. Why is it called the one, two? Because one of the hydrogens added to one uh, carbon one, the bromine added to carbon two. And then what's going to be my high temperature product? The one, four. The one, four. And importantly, let's make sure that it actually is the one, four. That we, well, first let's make sure we move our double bond. But you're exactly right. Well, we'll see, this was an example where it fit the pattern that we saw before perfectly. The next one's not gonna be as simple. Again, what's gonna be my low temperature product? Always. One, two. Do so I have a question about this one? Yeah. Wouldn't the bromine, uh, no, no, never mind. Yeah, why, you, dude, you're really good though. Why, why wouldn't it form? on the more highly substituted. So I was thinking that the bromine would add on to the end like the. Yeah, and I get why you're saying that because uh, with HBr you get that Markovnikov addition. The important the thing to remember is you go through a carbocation and when it's spaced yeah. here, it's an allylic carbocation, which is like the gold standard of all carbocation stabilities. Okay, okay, but anyways, good good side note, but let's uh, not get too bogged down on that. So anyway, we get the one four, uh, the, I'm sorry, the one two addition, right? But now let's go and we say, okay, at high temperatures, we should get that one four addition. But you wouldn't because it wouldn't be more highly substituted out to Exactly. Now. So now is where we're at this like a slightly more complicated thing where now we have to compare these two products and ask ourselves, which one is actually more stable? The left one on the left or the one on the right? One has three um, substituents and the one- It's on all the about how highly substituted that double bond is. So in this case, this wouldn't be my thermodynamic product because my double bond is not as highly substituted. So in this case, both of these would be that one four. I don't know if they're going to throw you an example or a tough one like that, but again, they love these thermodynamic versus kinetic control reactions. I can guarantee you something's going to be on there like this, whether or not it's as simple as, as the top one, that would be great, but let's just be prepared in case they throw us a curveball. Okay. Um, so I don't, I don't, uh, want to keep you guys too much longer, but one thing that I do want to make sure to go over, well, so first of all, this is kind of a silly one, but first, give me the product of this reaction here. Ow! No, soccer? Stop talking my foot. 
All right, so first of all, what do you think when you see this set of reagents here, particularly this guy right here gives it away? Um, isn't it an oxidizer? Or an yeah, oxidizer? Strong oxidizer. As soon as you see chromium, you should be thinking strong oxidizer, carboxylic acid, or maybe an alcohol if it's a secondary carbon. But um, yes, anyways, so hopefully I've trained you guys to when you see that, chromic, uh, that chromium, you're immediately thinking strong oxidizer. The reason I wanted to go over this reaction is because it's kind of bizarre. It doesn't matter how long this alkyl chain is, it's gonna chop it off at that benzylic carbon and you will get benzoic acid. Okay, it doesn't matter how long that chain is, it's gonna be cut off and become benzoic acid. Uh, there is an exception if it's a tertiary carbon, it won't react, but that's, you know, certainly review the notes, all that good stuff. But anyways, just something to remind everybody on. The last one that I wanna make sure they go over because for some reason the ACS just freaking loves these types of reactions are these deals alder reactions. We learned a lot of like pericyclic reactions. I can guarantee you there will be more than one problem on the ACS exam regarding these deals alder. I don't understand why they love them, but they freaking love them. Okay, so let's make sure we know what these products should look like. So everybody take a second and give me these two deals alder reaction products. I have a question. Yeah. Can we also go over like the, what were they, like the electrocyclic reactions? The, yeah. The, the weird stereochem. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, to be honest, uh, the uh, electrocyclic and the sigmatropic, I'm not saying don't study them, but I don't, I don't think I've ever seen them on the ACS exam. The deal's older, absolutely going to be there. Okay. Um, but we, we could definitely still go over examples. But I'm just saying in terms of if I'm prioritizing things in my mind, I want to make sure everybody actually reviews these deal's older because I can guarantee they're going to be on there. Review everything. Know everything. Don't get me wrong. Right, like, but uh, yeah. Because I'm really yeah, we'll, we'll people after this. Yeah, because I'm really the deals older is okay, but I don't remember those electric cyclic ones. It's the uh... yeah. So that's when the ring. We'll, we'll go over an example. Let's do this first. Um, okay, so let's remember, are these reactions well cyclic reactions because your electrons will move all in a circle. Doesn't matter which direction you want to push them, but they're all moving in a circle. Okay, so in this sort of simple example here, uh, the nice thing about the deals alder, you also always form a six membered ring. Okay, so in this case, this will be my product, and then I'm missing one double bond. Where does that go? I mean, on the left side. On the left side, nice. Right, so this is the formation of this bond. This is the formation of this bond. And then I have this other one, which is just moving the position of the double bond. Okay, uh, other things to remember about the deals older is stereochemistry is preserved. So if I had a cis double bond over here, I would have a cis product over here and vice versa. Okay, so I mean, it's fortunately, it's not very difficult, but just keep in mind stereochemistry is preserved. Okay, the other thing about deals older is um, you have 
probably the ugliest possible products that are formed, which are called these bicyclic pro products. So notice here, when I started out with these two fragments, I formed one new ring. If one of them is already in a ring, that ring's not gonna break. But I'm gonna add to it and get one of these bicyclic compounds. So again, I'm gonna have my electrons flowing in the same way. But my sort of original hexagon like two carbons will go up and is preserved. And then you have like this bridge formed on top of it. So my drawing is terrible. Let's see if I can find a good lecture slide. Isn't that like a chair conformer or something? Um, yeah, well, so, okay. So the, the, the way that you'll sort of always seen it, see it drawn Kind of like that like bent rectangle type thing. But. Here's a good example here. This is a little bit different because we started out with a five membered ring. One, two, three, four, five. So that would be one, two, three, four, five. You do the same thing with the six membered ring as well, though. Okay. Um, but the six membered ring, it makes like a kind of just like a square box on the top, or does it make a square box for even a five membered ring? So I guess I'm going to try to do this and keep this. Yeah, I mean, it was something like that. Okay. Uh, good news is you won't have to draw it. <laughs> just make sure you know what the picture looks like, um, you know, given if it's a multiple choice problem or something like that. Okay, but please, uh, there's other sort of considerations with regard to endo and exo, the endo products formed, whatever. Review deals alder, redo that lecture video, watch those lecture videos again, make sure you study that because it's the one topic that I can just guarantee you is gonna be on the ACS exam. Okay, so then the electrocyclic is, um, instead of having two fragments coming together, it's just like an intramolecular reaction that, that's like a ring closure reaction. And so you either have a six membered ring or starting out with six carbons or starting out with four carbons, all conjugated bonds. And again, the key is that you're gonna move your electrons all in a circle. These are again, electro, and what you're going to get is a ring closure that happens. Let me take a second and see what you can't tell me what my product would look like here with this ring closure for the four membered. Right, so hopefully we got a four-membered ring box. And then our pi bond has also moved. Okay. All right. So you guys have you guys have put in your time. No other one other thing I'll say about um, this particular 
reaction. And again, I don't think I've ever seen it on the ACS exam. So maybe don't break your back trying to memorize it. But remember, we kind of had this like trans like to cis. Basically, if it was catalyzed by heat or catalyzed by light, there was, well, let me just take that back. There was a different inversion of stereochemistry. Um, depending on whether it was six membered or four membered. Anyways, that's all summarized in this little cheat sheet of a table right here. Um, so yeah, I mean, if we're again, order of importance deals older, but if you guys are on the know everything kind of level, uh, this is that last level of complication with these reactions is sort of the change in stereochemistry that you would expect. Cool. All right. So make sure that you're uploading your notes to uh, to those various assignments. The one is under the exam three module, the exam three makeup module, to make sure that you guys um, make sure you submit that assignment because it'll actually open up the page where you can then go and take ex the exam three makeup. For this one, it's under the review sessions module, and just make sure you submit it so you get credit because that's part of how I'm taking attendance here. So uh, just take a picture of your notes, just like you do for the exam upload the PDF, yada, yada. I'll definitely stay on for questions 